Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, Sunshine State Digital Network's uh, Introduction to Conscious Editing, Part 2. Uh, so today, uh, we'll be hearing from four panelists. Um, and uh, this meeting is being recorded. Um, you will not be able to unmute yourself. Uh, we will also, uh, we have also enabled uh, live transcription. Uh, and it is automated, so there may be some errors, but you can feel free to turn that on or off at the bottom of your screen uh, by clicking on the CC button on the bottom. Uh, feel free to enter any questions that you may have in the chat box uh, during the presentation. We will be saving questions for presenters until the very end. Um, so our presenters for today are going to be Kelly Bolding from Princeton University, Laura Hart from U the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Meg Wren from the Bridgeport History Center, and Holly Smith from Spelman College. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our presenters today. Uh, and first up, uh, we have Laura. Okay. Um Good afternoon, everyone. Um, before we hit play on my presentation, I, I want to express my deep appreciation for the organizers of this wonderful conference and to acknowledge their hard work to make it happen. Thank you, Kayla, and thank you, Sunshine State Digital Network. I also want to share that I'm honored to participate in the conference and especially to join this stellar group of professionals on the panel whose work I deeply admire and find inspiring. And finally, I will call out Dorothy Berry for her brilliant presentation for part one of this conference. It is, I think, the essential primer for conscious editing and ethical descriptive practice. So thank you, Dorothy. And um, we can go ahead and hit play. My presentation today is titled Conscious Editing for Racial Equity, Reframing Archival Description of plantation records. I will follow Dorothy's lead and contextualize this presentation by telling you a little bit about myself and about Wilson Special Collections Library, where I work as a technical services archivist and as an advocate and practitioner of conscious editing. My name is Laura Hart. I am a white, neurodivergent, and cisgender Gen Xer. I was born and raised in New Orleans a city I still consider my one true home, though Durham, North Carolina has been a lovely second home over the past two decades. I grew up in a culturally rich, ethnically diverse, but still racially divided city where I had white privilege. Though I did not hear the term white privilege until much later in life, I knew I had it from a young age. I saw how my black classmates and fellow campers were treated differently than their white counterparts. And I knew that my white fourth grade teacher discouraged me from playing with my friend Nicole because she was black. My parents were professors at the University of New Orleans, which was the South's first public university integrated from its founding in 1956. I have spent the entirety of my life in and around academia and have worked at state universities for the greater part of my 25 year career in archives. Wilson Special Collections Library is a part of an academic library system in a research one university. The University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill is a historically white university built by enslaved people. The university did not admit black students until the late 1950s, and it maintained a Confederate memorial at its front door until 2018 when anti-racist activists toppled it. One of Wilson Library's core collecting strengths is the history of the American South, and the Jim Crow South was the backdrop for its earliest collecting efforts. The Southern Historical Collection has long served an important role in the historiography of the South and scholars have mined its collections for decades to write critical academic works about slavery, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, the New South, and the Civil Rights Movement. But those same collections hold promise for so much more than just monographs and scholarly articles. 
I want to pose two overarching questions that are really calls for action. The first is, what if we centered black people when we described plantation records? The call to action is let's center black people, the enslaved, the self-emancipated, the free, the manumitted, when we describe plantation records. The second question, what if we thought of black genealogists and family historians and researchers of the enslaved as the central audience when we consciously edit archival description of plantation records? The call for action is let's work for racial equity in the archive by making black genealogists, family historians, and researchers of the enslaved our central audience when we consciously edit archival description of plantation records. Why should we consciously edit existing description for 18th and 19th century papers that scholars have already successfully used over and over again? Because these records carry a measurable meaning beyond academia for people looking for their people in the historical record that left too many nameless and almost always in the margins. In the absence of vital records and census data for people enslaved in the American South, plantation papers kept by the enslavers may well be the only extant paper records of their lives. In the epilogue of her beautiful book, Help Me to Find My People, The African American Search for Families Lost in Slavery, historian Heather Andrea Williams writes, genealogy is personal, it is individual, and it is private but it also contributes to a larger work of naming people, of recognizing their existence, and of saying that their existence is worthy of remembrances. Through conscious editing, we can help make the individual's genealogy and the larger work of naming people more possible. Wilson Library Southern Historical Collection holds hundreds of archival record groups that document black people who were enslaved on plantations and farms, at mills, fisheries, railroads, and ports, at colleges and universities, including UNC, and in towns and cities across the American South during the 18th and 19th centuries. These record groups range in size from a single item like a plantation ledger to 33,000 items occupying 69 linear feet of shelf space. They hold documents found nowhere else, documents created and kept by the enslavers so that they could manage their assets and the people they claimed as property. The enslavers recorded names, ages, birth dates, death dates, occupations, illnesses, and acts of resistance and dozens of these collections contain letters composed by enslaved people, usually addressed to their enslavers. The documents are there to be mined by black genealogists and family historians, but the records are obscured by description focused on white people and by the organizing principle of provenance that centered white people. Most plantation collections were acquired as donations from the direct descendants of the plantation owners, the wealthy elite white people who had enslaved black people. The white historians and archivists who acquired these collections followed the principle of provenance and created separate collections for each group of records received from the donors. They named each collection to align with its provenance. Cameron family papers, Pettigrew family papers, and so many more filling more than 1,000 linear feet of shelving in Wilson Library stacks. Initially, these collections of family papers were described in what were called calendars. A calendar was a chronological list of a collection's contents. There was little to no narrative description. I think of the WPA workers who first described some of the earliest acquisitions and picture them placing a pane of glass over a document to flatten it and read it. Looking through plain glass, they gathered the facts set before them in each document and listed those facts. But a presentation of facts is never neutral, and these proto-archivists were not without implicit bias. They privileged chronology over content, and they highlighted autographs, correspondence, legal documents, military records, and other materials by and about white men. 
the arrangement and item level description in the calendars obscured as much as it illuminated about each collection as a whole. Calendars had their advantages, especially as straight inventories that on the whole were accurate, accurate enough that we still consult them. They typically included substantial and valuable metadata, personal names, sometimes even the names of enslaved people, corporate names, dates, geographic locations, and forms and genres of documents. What isn't in the calendars is context. Much later in the 1980s and 1990s, these collections were reprocessed and redescribed in advance of mass commercial microfilming projects. Archivists compiled modern finding aids following the descriptive standards in place at the time, the predecessor to DAX known as APPM. Archivists arranged the collections into series and subseries, bringing together like materials, like letters and volumes, and ordering those format groupings chronologically. They wrote fairly lengthy and sometimes far too lengthy narrative descriptions and scoped content notes, biographical notes, and series notes. These new finding aids had folder lists instead of item lists, which facilitated the mass microfilming underway. The new APPM finding aids were rich in context, but it was context with limited utility beyond the central audience, academic historians, for whom the narrative descriptions and notes were written. When we assume academic historians are the central audience of our finding aids, we naturally take some shortcuts or even omit altogether explanations of commonly understood historical language and historical terms of art. When we write for historians, we also emphasize what we think they would find interesting. Archivists in the 80s and 90s showed a keen eye for finding and describing materials with rich social history content. I imagine graduate history students brainstorming 15 different dis dissertation topics just from browsing the paper finding aids. The description also privileged whatever material predominated in quantity and interest for social historians. If a collection had a lot of correspondence by women, white women of course, the description of the women's correspondence matched in quantity and quality of detail. The far fewer documents about slavery were identified, but they were often described with a detached scholarly tone that gazed past the enslaved person's humanity. The lens used to look at the documents of Fresh at the end of the 20th century was a scholarly lens. In the 2000s and 2010s, we expanded our audience through our mass digitization efforts and our pedagogical work with faculty. Undergraduate students became a primary audience for our collections and description. We also had new descriptive standards in DAX. We added an enhanced description of documents related to enslaved people, but here we were still focused on an academic audience, albeit one increasingly composed of students. Since 2017, we've approached our descriptive work purposefully with a conscious editing ethos and with ethical descriptive principles and practices we are still developing. We are now returning to the plantation finding aids and we are considering how we can reframe them for an expanded audience with black genealogists and family historians at its center. We are trying to focus our description with a racial equity lens. Historic Stagbill in North Carolina is dedicated to teaching about the lives and work of enslaved people. The Whitney Plantation Museum in Louisiana is a museum of slavery on the grounds of a historical sugar, rice, and indigo plantation. These two museums have focused in a racial equity lens on the plantations they preserve. The stories they tell, the guided tours they give, their educational missions do not focus on the beautifully furnished mansion. Instead, they center enslaved people and the places and structures where they lived, worked, resisted, survived, and died. To amplify silence narratives in the archives, we can start with conscious editing. We can lead 
are narrative collection overviews with description of the content related to Black and Indigenous people, even when that content does not represent the bulk of the physical collection's contents. We can flatten the steep hierarchical structure of series and subseries and simplify the intellectual organization. We can elevate content related to enslaved people. The contents list does not need to start with folder one. We can lead with containers with content related to enslaved people. We can center the individual. We can remove marginalizing language. We can respect and amplify the person's humanity. We can contextualize historical language so that an expanded audience understands what it is we are describing. We can remove lost cause mythology that implies slavery was a benevolent institution. Had you asked me 10 years ago whether we should add the word white to describe a family whose members claimed people as property, I would have said no, because of course they were white. Why state the obvious? But when we call out race and ethnic identity of black, brown, and indigenous people, but stay silent on white identity, we are upholding an invisible norm that makes everyone other than white people other. We are also taking a short view. What is considered common knowledge today might not be common or known tomorrow. And even today, historical knowledge might not be as common as we think. By identifying white people, we are adding clarity and racial equity to our description. We want to say the names of the enslaved, to embrace their humanity and to understand deep down in hearts and minds that their lives mattered and that their descendants' lives matter. But is a finding aid the right place for what could be hundreds of names, dates, occupations, family relationships that we uncover in these documents? Of course it is not. What I imagine in the future is a database for all the names and life dates of the enslaved people documented in Wilson Library's holdings, a database that recorded relationships of enslaved individuals and families to each other and to the people who enslaved them, and connected individuals to the plantations, farms, towns, and cities where they lived, worked, and died, a database that could feed into other aggregations of data about enslaved people. I imagine archivists working with descendant communities to uncover the documents and build the tools needed for descendants to make meaningful connections with their ancestors. Until then, we can extend the discoverability of these names with consciously edited description. In so doing, we will be laying the groundwork for the next steps of a long journey to racial equity in the archives. I'll close with another quotation from Heather Andrea Williams, Help Me to Find My People. And all the digging and probing and imagining is not only intended to find the history of an individual or of a particular family, it is also meant to help construct the history of a people. My presentation. All right. Um, well, that is a very hard act to follow, and I feel like there's an end to the circus. There's kind of a big jump, but um, that's what we're going to do. So as already said, my name is Meg Rim, and I am an assistant archivist here at the Bridgeport History Center, which is a part of the Bridgeport Public Library in Bridgeport, Connecticut. My portion of the panel will focus on the sport disabilities, and uh, we both a case study and a recommendation at large. So, um, let's 
Come on. Right. So let's talk about the PP Barnum digital collection in a collaborative digitization project that I was in Taiwan and the Medicare an expert for. It was funded by the National Endowment for Humanities and was the clean. I'm sorry, I can't take off a mask right now. Um, certain policy. Um, it was a collaborative project between the Barnum Museum and the Bridgeport History Center. And it combines the museum objects located in, at the museum and the archival um, material here at the History Center. The description for all of the objects are, it, for the digital objects, are museum based, even for the archival material and that was written into our grant and that actually had a really big bearing on uh, what ended up happening with the plot hat. So, where does disability come in on this? So the true tension with the material, a lot of material in the PP Barnum digital collection is that it depicts uh, people with disabilities to the point where the question is, what do you do with them? The disability is why this person was famous, how they were marketed, and how and why we've gotten these documents in the first place. Moreover, and more to the point, this was someone's job, and not everyone was coerced into hopelessness. And it's very easy to say, oh, that's problematic, but that doesn't engage with the nuance and experiences of these people's lives. Uh, they were complicated, and one size does not fit all in discussing them. But before I get into that, I do want to pause and talk about the buy-in. Uh, if you're here and if you're interested in conscious editing, you already know that there are terms and that are outdated and harmful and that not carrying them over into contemporary description is important. Now, the other thing is that in a collection like this, with PP Barnum, the name is your warning. You know that you're going to encounter something physical and not great, but not every collection comes with that. Back to the bottom. Some projects are very high profile, and the misuse of language can and will have um, negative repercussions. Uh, but also sitting down and thinking about how to consciously edit, edit something is not only a form of education, but it becomes a form of documentation, which can lead in very quickly become the creation of local standards, especially when you don't have like, you know, situations or are, are limited by vocabularies or other factors. So, as the project cataloger, it was my job to figure out how to deal with the material and all of the ways it could go wrong, basically. And my project managers were aware that describing people with disabilities was something that we had to figure out and we had to hit the ground running on it. So I looked at other collections, uh, looked at their metadata, looked at their descriptive choices. And I look at museums, digital collections, secondary works, cultural heritage sites, because we're in, archives are not the only folks having these conversations, and we gain a lot by looking at our colleagues across the discipline. Looking at their literature also is really important. Um, I also made a point to look at disability studies and give myself a crash course on that. Because that really was key to making sense of how people with disabilities who are active and involved uh, in that world want to discuss this kind of material. And from there, we sat down uh, as a group 
and figure out what you like, what you didn't like, what our thought limits were, everything. What we were locked into, like Ella was saying, yada, yada, yada. And this resulted in the creation of project standards that you have in this closed project. But also, because we were in a specific project, we had a little bit of time on our side to sit down and look at the people whose names come up and and then had preferences. And while we were aware that, hey, nine times out of ten, we're not gonna know, we actually found out that there were preferences involved. Not if we wouldn't know them today, but they absolutely exist, and because we were working with uh, more involved in the same level description, we could include them. So just to write a lot of some examples, Anne Jones, who was a married woman, actively fought against the civil work fleet. Lavinia Warren, who uh, was a little person, wrote very frankly of her experiences uh, in her autobiography. Her husband, Harold Stratton, who was also a little person, signed his spirit name in a very particular way. And Neil and Kristen, who uh, were conjoint twins and were on my first flight, had very explicit instructions about who can view the area where they were conjoined uh, outside of the performance. But let's talk about the standards that we set for ourselves in the project. Number one, we acknowledge the public and the private persona, and we only use spirit names when discussing a performer or their career. So Harold Stratton versus his spirit name was General Tom Thumb. One we use more often, the other is only for his act and his, for his career. Um, we were limited to using the library of Congress patterns, but we use the people with disability patterns a lot in conjunction with a um, more diagnostic term when libraries Congress did not have preferred terms. So worthless um, is an LOC, little people is not. And we couldn't use custom vocabulary for reasons I can't even get into. Um, in addition, uh, we, by looking at models of disability, we were able to find one known as complex environment which let us balance some medical diagnosis and issues with social barriers to inclusion. This let us talk about more individual experience and nuance, which was incredibly important and helped from our perspective. Um, we were also able to write and include uh, biographies for uh, reoccurring uh, individuals. And that let us emphasize the lives, not only discrimination performance, and thus implicitly disability. Uh, we also have a language statement in our collection uh, that basically goes into why we did what we did, how we arrived at the conclusions that we did, and what our limits were. And this allows us to show due diligence and understanding, as well as show documentation that we are aware of the issues and we are feeling our level best with them. Now, and I know what we're all about to say is, hey, that's great, but I do not have the kind of thing of doing this much, much research. And you know what? Obviously, we're a project, we got the luxury of time. So what can you do? Gordon set this in her part of the series, and I think it's worth repeating. Do what you can, where you can, with the resources available. You're not going to have a project that lets you do something like this. And if you do, you're very lucky. But as archivists, cat lovers, librarians, and other information professionals, we're ready to work used to work and manipulate in the spaces we already occupy. So what can you do? Step one, acknowledge imperfect description. There's never going to be a perfect description, and the minute you're all right with that is the minute you take a lot of stress off yourself. Also, I'm going to do language in particular because change very rapidly, and something that you write might become out there in a year or two or five or whatever. But that's really important. 
Another one is what spaces can you use? So with us, we were able to use our museum level of script pen. If you're writing a five and eight, you can use spoken content and biographical information to include relevant information about what you're working with and provide context. So as an example, these surface handles or major bot focuses heavily on Samuel short stature. The material centers on, on his height because that was his major selling point. This marketing was not unusual for people of short stature who went up in the of performances in the late 1800s. However, and this was not the only line of work that people in the nation, and we have a lot of photo documentation of people living at home with family and in the nation and more normal civilian life. So this is, um, this is particularly if you're working with historic material, but research in the contemporary community, and I can't emphasize this one enough. Look at how people talk about themselves and how they want other people to talk about them. Mirror that language in your description. We get three such items, your bio file, your biographical info, whatever is available to you, write it in. And if you have the time, and this is a really good if, and you have an idea and set the time to do this, reach out to the community, tell them about your work, and invite them to the table. Talk about limits, see if they have a community on work around. It's a step that, again, you might not have time for, but if you can, do it. Also, seek out nuance. This is a really important one for me in particular. I got lucky. I found the model of disability called complex environment, which acknowledges the medical and social elements of disability and lots of time and better to focus on individual experience. And when you within that model, really let me work with the tension of medical diagnosis. Even if someone's claim to fame or the main reason that they were marketed in a particular way, without limiting myself to market it to that part of my life. It's a great way of different plot signing subject items too. Uh, just think about the whole. If this person had a particular diagnosis, what their job was, and pretend that one included them both. Because the other thing is your researchers are going to be coming at different angles as well. So in the point in both also got some more eyes on it. But I can talk about that in questions later. And finally, uh, avoid being like that. Uh, and I think that there is a very important difference between saying it was wrong then and wrong now versus we're not even going to end the house to it up that way. Avoiding telling your patient how to think is important because you're processing complicated, having them sometimes painful information. And they're, they're quickly consciously aware of that, but they're more likely than that would be on a subconscious level. It's on you to provide guidance on how to reflect, how to approach a subject. But if you say something, never think about a person in terms of only medical information, they might bounce pretty hard off of that and take away the opposite information. Um, thank you. Um, all of my images are from the Pink Learn and Digital Collection. You can visit them at pinkdigitalarchive.org and click on Pink Learn and Digital Collection. I look forward to your questions. Hey, everyone. Um, okay. So thanks uh, to Kayla for organizing today, um, to my fellow panelists for their talks, um, and to everyone to um, here for giving your time to this topic during a particularly stressful week. Uh, my name is Kelly Bolding. I'm going to speak to you today about conscious editing um, in the context of Princeton University Libraries Inclusive Description Working Group. Um, so in the first session, Dorothy set a great example, um, and as did Laura today, that I'm going to follow by positioning herself in relation to this topic. Um, so I come at 
this work from a different place, but my identities and backgrounds similarly influence my approach. Um, I'm a white queer cisgender woman, and as a white woman, I represent a dominant identity in this field. While some aspects of my lived experience have aided me in doing redescription work, um, my whiteness has meant that I have had to overcome my socialization to not see some types of harm. Um, I speak on this topic today, not as an expert, but as someone who is continuously learning how to do this work from the particular position that I occupy. Um, I've worked at Princeton University on a string of term contracts for the past seven years. And my experience with conscious editing has come largely, largely through my role as chair of Princeton's Inclusive, Inclusive Description Working Group and as a co-author of the Black Archives for Black Lives in Philadelphia's Anti-Racist Description Resources. Um, so my approach has been influenced by the context where I work, uh, which is a wealthy, predominantly white institution that collects across a wide range of subject areas and time periods. Many of the issues we're addressing stem from my institution's long colonial history and collecting model. Um, while, there's still, while there is a growing institutional commitment to repair for this history, we still have to compete for reparative description work to be prioritized. Um, our methodology consists of a large scale cross repository description audit that attempts to survey oppressive description in a variety of forms, including racism, gender bias, homophobia, and ableism. I'll talk about how we've gone about this, the pros and cons of this type of approach, and extract some takeaways that I hope are relevant across contexts. Um, so the Inclusive Description Working Group at Princeton was formed in May of 2019. We're one of several working groups within the archival description and processing team within Special Collections. The working group represents a formalization of a web of related efforts that began in 2016. Um, these included an exploratory description audit and several small ad hoc projects in 2016 and 2017. Also between 2017 and 2019, several Princeton archivists joined Archives for Black Lives in Philadelphia's anti-racist description working group. Um, this group spent nearly two years researching, gathering feedback, and drafting a set of resources aimed at implementing anti-racist description practices. While this was an independent effort, um, what we learned during the process was instrumental in helping us make informed decisions locally. Um, so this is a general overview of our process at Princeton, which I'll walk through step by step. Our first step was research and self-reflection. Um, since several people in our working group had participated in creating an extensive bibliography for the anti-racist description resources, we already had a strong list of literature to start with. We supplemented this by gathering examples of statements, policies, and use cases that were emerging from other institutions. Oops, apologies for being very slow with my slides. Oops. So something that we learned and tried to carry over from the anti-racist description project was the importance of self-awareness and self-reflection. Around the time our working group was formed, um, our team participated together in Helen Wong Smith's online uh, cultural diversity competency course through SAA, which gave us a structured opportunity to discuss how our differing identities impact our work as archivists. I also wanna highlight that research and self-reflection are ongoing processes. Each remediation project presents different issues and requires additional labor. While research helps us improve our description of cultures that we are not as familiar with, it's simply not possible for us to be experts in every culture. Uh, this is why I think Jessica Tai's framing of anti-oppressive description within a cultural humility framework is so important. Uh, she writes, dismantling traditional concepts of expertise requires flexibility and humility and being able to accept the limitations in serving as the authoritative voice on another's experience. This is something that is crucial to keep in mind throughout the process of revising description, especially when we engage with others. Um, to inform users about harmful description and our finding aids and our efforts to address it and to let folks know that we are open to feedback. Um, the statement was inspired in large part by a statement from Temple University. So in addition to providing transparency, the statement encourages users to report problematic description using the suggest a correction button on our finding aid site. Um, so we also created internal documentation, which consists of a set of guidelines for inclusive description and a collection of redescription case studies. 
We envision both of these tools as iterative living documents. The internal guidelines draw heavily from the anti-racist description resources, including guidance on voice and style, prioritizing self-description, balancing the need to preserve original context while mitigating harm on users, and transparently documenting interventions. The guidelines are general in scope, but they also link to an expanding list of external community specific terminology resources with a focus on resources created by people who are from or in close relationship to the communities they pertain to. Another important piece of our internal documentation is a continuously growing Google Doc containing local case studies that touch on different descriptive issues. We found this to be helpful as a means of grounding our approach within practical examples, as well as providing space for reflection that, that encourages us to revisit, critique, and improve upon our own work over time. Um, so after we established our documentation, we set out to conduct a description audit to identify problem areas and help us prioritize our redescription efforts. So this was a two part process. Um, for one part, we we're encouraging colleagues and users to report problematic description by publicizing the existence of the su suggest a correction button. We're also meeting with colleagues in public services and instruction to let them know that we're interested in their feedback. As a result, we've had a few opportunities to meet with undergraduate classes to engage students in critical discussions about archival description. And we hope that over time, these outreach efforts will expand and empower more people in our institutional community to suggest revisions. Oops. Um, so another part of our audit was an automated survey of all of our EAD finding aids across Princeton's three archival repositories. We built the survey using XQuery, which is a language for querying XML data, along with regular expressions that search for a specific lexicon of terms. The scripts were repurposed from our previous project to identify unprocessed media. The list on the slide contains some broad categories of terms included in the lexicons, which we generated in consultation with public services colleagues. I also wanna note that our lexicons are intended to flag terms um, that we can go back and evaluate how they were used in context, um, not to do a simple find replace operation. So we're using this method, not just to identify harmful terms, but also to, to attempt to surface erased voices within collections. So the terms in the lexicon are not all necessarily problematic. Um, so another automated query we ran was a search for terms of aggrandizement and biographical notes. This stemmed from observations that many of our biographical notes contain an excessive amount of flowery language that serves to valorize predominantly white male collection creators. In addition to revisiting notes flagged by the script, we also approved a brief set of local guidelines for biographical notes moving forward to promote descriptive equity. Processors are encouraged to steer away from lengthy notes and praising language in favor of more concise notes that focus on information important for understanding the records at hand. We're also leveraging biographical notes to mitigate some of the descriptive inequity that emerges from the, from the fact that archival collections are arranged by provenance. Due to the colonial and patriarchal ways in which many of our collections were formed, smaller groups of records created by women, indigenous people, and people of color can often be found within collections created by white men. In order to improve discoverability of creators who appear further down the finding aid hierarchy, such as creators of series or in some cases files, we're increasingly writing biographical notes for creators at these more granular levels. Um, and our workflow at Princeton, encoding creator information and biographical note tags at these levels generates an EAC CPF record, which we hope to eventually be able to expose in aggregated systems like SNAC. Um, so Laura spoke about this with much, much more nuance than I will hear, um, but many of the collections that fall under my responsibility at Princeton include slavery records. Um, when serving, this is one of the areas where I encountered some of the more glaring instances of dehumanizing language. And it's also one of the areas where users and staff have pointed out problematic language most often. Um, Dr. P. Gabrielle Foreman has an excellent community source document on writing about slavery, which has been an important resource. I've also made an effort to prioritize redescription for these collections with a focus on replacing dehumanizing language but also on including names of enslaved people and contextual information that might help genealogists and researchers identify enslaved people. 
Another area where we're where we are beginning to focus more is on surfacing and improving the discoverability of women creators and subjects who are erased by previous descriptive practices. In this case, a reference archivist noticed that a collection that had been described for decades as the Willard Thorpe papers um, actually contained both the papers of Willard Thorpe and Margaret Farron Thorpe, his wife, who was a scholar, author, and journalist in her own right. The processing archivist updated the title of the collection to reflect both Willard and Margaret's names, as well as other descriptive fields to indicate the dual nature of the collection's creation. We've also used scripts to generate lists of fields in our finding aids where women are described as only Mrs. Husband's name. We plan to use these lists to go back and research these women so that we can provide their full names. I um, mean, Celeste Brewer recently did a great write-up of a workflow for a similar project at Columbia that we've been consulting. Um, and since transparency is essential, I also wanna provide some examples of how we're documenting redescription. Rather than simply correcting and erasing problems, we leave traces of our actions with the expectation that a future archivist will intervene to correct our own work. Um, the examples here are brief processing information notes that we've included in finding aids. When warranted, we also include a more detailed redescription project documentation in our collection files. Um, and we also maintain older versions of our finding aids in a version control system that we use to manage our EADs which includes internal commit notes that summarize updates. So reflecting on our process so far, some benefits of our method um, include that a comprehensive survey is a good way to locate lots of data that you can use to demonstrate to administrators where the problems are and to advocate for prioritizing remediation. Looking across all collections also helps us identify hidden voices in places where we may not have expected them. Having a broader scope also means that staff can choose where to focus their redescription efforts based on their areas of knowledge and their capacity to engage in various ways. Um, depending on the topic and your own personal, personal connection to it, redescription can be emotionally taxing and it's important to make sure that folks doing this work have an opportunity, opportunity to decide for themselves what they're up for. Um, as for the downsides, I would say that community engagement is one of the areas where we still need to improve. It's definitely easier to find appropriate people to collaborate with when the focus of the project is more narrowly scoped. Also, an automated survey could be more or less challenging depending on where your data lives and tools for um, tools available for querying your data. Um, so finally, I just want to leave you with some general takeaways that I hope will be useful in a variety of different contexts. Um, and I think some of these relate to things that Meg mentioned. Um, so first, use the tools that you have. They don't have to be complicated as long as they get the job done. In our case, we had the most success when using tools that we already had available. For example, XQuery version control and the suggest a correction button, but you can accomplish the same things with different tools. Uh, second, prioritize changes that have a direct impact on users. This is something Dorothy touched on in the Q&A for her session that I thought was really important. Um, approaching this type of work can be overwhelming when there are so many problems at so many different levels. Um, if you get stuck, focus on what is causing the most harm and preventing discoverability of marginalized groups. Um, also take action within your realm of responsibility. So folks attending the session likely have differing levels of institutional support and power. Um, I, got in this, I got involved in this work initially because I was a project archivist responsible for reprocessing early US history collections. And I was able to argue that this work fit into my job description. Um, with regards to getting buy-in from administrators, one thing that I found effective is framing redescription as an access issue. By providing inequitable description, we're providing inequitable access, which goes against most institutional missions and ethics. Um, also, if you have a say in prioritizing collections for redescription, make reparative work a factor in determining processing levels. Um, a reparative approach means redirecting monetary and staffing resources in ways that atone for past harms, um, which, which means that other things are going to get less attention. Um, unless we're willing to give up something else in order to make this happen, then our work isn't truly reparative. Um, lastly, I just wanna emphasize the point that redescription is iterative. Language and the way that we frame historical events changes over time. So there's never gonna be a magical point at which our description is suddenly unproblematic. Um, conscious editing is a continuous harm reduction practice that needs to be something that we integrate into our daily work. Um, and on that note, thank you so much. And I look forward to speaking with you more in the Q&A. Thank
And I'm sorry, Holly, I may have messed up the screen share. I don't know if oh, Kevin- No worries, I was like, I'm sorry. I'm I didn't mean to leave you hanging. <laughs> oh, thank you, no worries at all. I um, am very uh, excited that we can even do this uh, remotely and share the screen. So, um, and a huge thank you to again, Kayla and the planning committee for this opportunity. A huge thank you to my um, wonderful colleagues who gave such compelling and thought provoking and important uh, discussion prior to this. And um, again, a huge thank you to all of you um, who are here with us, You know, considering all the things that are going on globally, politically, um, I don't think this is necessarily separate and an important conversation. So my um, discussion today will be a little different than my um, colleagues who spoke previously, rather than speaking specifically about efforts around um, conscious editing and metadata, I'm going to speak about specifically a digital project focusing on historically black colleges and universities and some of the things that we have been doing around description, but overall the importance of really being able to access materials specifically at HBCUs and why that is so critical. Um, to situate myself, I'm a Black cis hetero woman born and raised in the South. I worked at predominantly white institutions uh, and am currently working at historically Black college and institution um, now and have a long history in working in public history and African American history. So this, I find this uh, very important to me personally and professionally. And I do apologize for some reason, I seem to have trouble finding the slide button. I think that's more just me, thank you. <laughs> so just a little situating and background, if you're not familiar with uh, Spelman uh, College itself, Spelman College is an HBCU founded in 1881 as Atlanta Baptist Female Seminary with the specific intent to educate women of the African diaspora. And it's one of two remaining colleges, HBCUs now, including Bennett College in North Carolina, where that was the um, mission. So Spelman has been documenting its history really since the beginning. Um, and the space that we're in now currently was created in 1996, the physical space. So we are actually part of the Women's Resource and Research Center on campus. And I'll get more into that in just a second. So we are the institutional repository for Spelman College, meaning we document the history of the college, but because we are part of the Women's Resource and Research Center, and as well having a charge for special collections, we do document women of the African diaspora broadly. So just a little bit more about the Women's Resource and Research Center. Um, it was founded in 1981 by a uh, Black feminist icon, and, uh, Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftall, and it houses the competitive excuse me, Comparative Women's Studies Program. And it's really the hotbed of, of progressive feminist activity on campus. So we are actually, the Spelman Archives are part of the Women's Resource Center because there is, if you're familiar with um, uh, HBCUs in Atlanta at all, Spelman is part of a consortia, the largest consortia of HBCUs known as the Atlanta University Center or AUC. So the AUC does have a library to serve all the schools in the consortia. And, which is known as Atlanta University Center Robert Woodruff Library and AUC Woodruff has an archives. So we work very closely with our colleagues there, but Dr. Guy Sheftall really, when work, she was working on the Centennial History of Spelman back in 80, envisioned um, keeping the archives here on campus so students would have access to that. So that um, explains why we are in situated within the Women's Center. And I think it's a really unique and powerful opportunity for amplifying uh, archives specifically situated and focused on uh, Black women. So this is just an overview of the different types of collections that we have. Um, again, thinking about the, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, thinking, of, thank you, Kimberly, exactly. Um, and if you don't know Dr. Guy Sheft, all your assignment is to really um, <laughs> do some work and some research on her today. Um, so this is just an overview of the different types of collections that we have, um, this, uh, university collections as well as special collections, such as artist Selma Burke, um, musician Josephine Harold Love, as well as the Dobbs family, a very iconic family in Atlanta. And again, so these 
of the publications that we have, and I'm going to center my discussion most on the publications that were digitized as part of this project as well. Um, but we have a number of publications that have been um, in publication since really the founding of the school, such as the uh, well, the Spelman um, Messenger, which is the official uh, magazine of the campus, has been in publication since 1885 continuously to the present, such as the yearbooks. And if you're not familiar also with Sage Journal as well, that was, if I'm not mistaken, one of the first or the first um, scholarly journal that situated Black feminist theory and research and work by and about Black women um, as well. So that's, and that's also been digitized. I can share that link with everyone later. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we are also the home in the repository of the Audrey Lord papers. Um, and if, again, if you're not familiar with Audrey Lord, your assignment is to go do some work and uh, reading and research on her, um, known as a lesbian feminist activist, mother of warrior poet, who was also a librarian. Um, Audrey Lord has written some of the most iconic uh, feminist uh, texts um, that really, you know, are situated around our conversation today, powerful critiques around the patriarchy, racism, sexism, as well as, as homophobia. And this is probably our most heavily used special collection um, to date, people traveling nationally and internationally to use these materials. And our other most heavily used special collection are the work of feminist writer, uh, cultural worker and educator, Tony Cade Bambara. Um, another assignment, please read The Salt Eaters by the end of the year if you haven't read that, one of the most profound novels I've ever read. But in addition to being a writer, um, Tony K. Bambar was also an educator and filmmaker, and her collection is uh, pretty, very rich in, term, in regard to drafts, uh, video materials, um, just very rich collections as well. So what I'll uh, focus on for the remainder of my time today is talking specifically about a digitization project that Spellman was a partner on that really amplified um, the work and continues to amplify the work and research uh, by and about Black people at historically Black colleges and universities. And I think this is certainly HBCUs have had um, digitization projects, but this really allowed for quite a significant amount of material to be digitized and made accessible. And in the case of Spellman, uh, this is really the first time that we were able to have a significant number of materials uh, digitized and made accessible. So the Our Story project was funded by a generous grant from the Council of Library and Information Resources or CLEAR. And you can see the project partners on the slide there. Um, Atlanta University Woodruff was the principal and partnered with Spelman College, Morehouse, and the Digital Library of Georgia, DLG. And um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about that project there. So the project focused on digitizing publications as well as some of the photograph collections from schools that are currently part of the Atlanta University Center AUC or historically, such as Morehouse Brown. And this just Morehouse, Morehouse Brown, excuse me, you all, Morris Brown College. Uh, so this just gives you an overview of the different types of materials that were digitized as part of the um, digitization project. And I think one thing really important to emphasize here um, so in HBCU archive, we're going to have different concerns, again, than the uh, issues that my colleagues just outlined at a PWI, typically, um, where as opposed to at a PWI, you frequently might not have materials that were created in the voice of the communities they're reflecting. The majority of our content was created by and about the diverse Black communities. Now, does that mean there's still not issues around amplification of diverse voices? Absolutely not. But I think one of the most important things to consider about um, HBCUs is that's often the only opportunity you're going to find or in, in great, um, what am I trying to say, in great number, the content around not only the college or university, but the surrounding Black communities and other um, Black scholars and intellectuals and activists and organizers. So these collections really just go beyond highlighting the universities and colleges. And so I just want to go in a little bit to talk about some of the digitized Spelman uh, publications. So again, this is the Spelman Messenger, which has been in continuous um, operation uh, publication since uh, 1885. And my apologies, that slide on the right, it should say November 1918, not 1988, which um, 
and if you, you can't really see it there uh, too much, but that just highlights what was going on during the pandemic in 1918 on Spelman's campus. So again, these materials have very important implications. And on the right, you can um, see when Audre Lorde came to campus in 1988 as well. So again, this is a reflection. So the course catalogs as well as the yearbooks and the course catalogs, thinking about what Laura mentioned are very important around the um, doing genealogy work because the early catalogs would often list the name of students, where they're from, sometimes the courses they took. So, and um, even the yearbooks as well, we get a lot of questions and inquiries about clubs or when something was founded or what was going on. So these have been very useful as well. I'm particularly a big fan of the student newspapers because you are getting things from the perspective of student groups. So the Spelman Spotlight now known as the Blueprint and the Campus Mirror which ran from, um, goodness, 1924 to 1950, would particularly have uh, documentation and articles by students about things that are going on. Exactly, the spotlight was talking about, you know, campus restrictions and visitation to everything from apartheid and reproductive justice. So they're really rich um, in content as well. And what's been particularly rich in terms of uh, digitization and access are our photograph collections. So as part of this project, uh, we digitized, again, and I should say and emphasize the point of this project, all the materials that were digitized were things that had existing metadata, things that each of the universities had, um, there were no copyright issues or that we owned. So the majority of things that were digitized um, as part of this project, certainly reflective of the school, and out of the thousand photographs that were digitized, um, we focused on commencement, uh, presidents, our drama and dance department, as well as buildings and grounds, which really give you an overview of how the campus has changed over time. So again, these are just some images from the different uh, collections that we have utilized or photograph collection. And when you go into the digital project, which again, if you Google our story or it'll be in the slide or um, I can drop it in the chat box as well. All the publications have been digitized that have been digitized or OCR. So you can search uh, for a particular name within any of the publications as well as the photographs so you're able to download a low res uh, image for you know, use. And we do ask people just to contact us for permission or any you know, inquiries, but they are available, freely available in that way. And also wanted to take this time to highlight another um, component of this project that came. Um, thank you so much, Prashana, for doing that. Uh, the, this component that came out of after this project. So in speaking about resources and things that you have that existed um, beforehand, somebody in the drama and uh, dance department years ago had created a very wonderful, very um, detailed timeline particularly more heavily focused on the theater than dance really, but really an outline kind of of the history of the departments. And if you don't know anything about theater in uh, dance at Spelman or in the Atlanta University Center, I mean, one of just the premier um, places for uh, drama in black communities and black actors and producers in a way. So this timeline was created with that um, analog timeline using some of those materials as well as the images. So if you want to, and it's not meant to be fully comprehensive, it doesn't document every production or every dance, but this is a good um, start to get you into the collection in materials and something we look to be adding uh, to as well. So here's a link uh, to the portals as well, the different places you can access the digitized content. And just to you know, capitalize on what our colleagues were saying and the importance of this project. So this is an ongoing engagement with alumni, students, and community for this project. And one of the reasons why is, again, I mentioned HBCUs might have different, very different concerns around PWIs for access, but this was an image that came up in, um, <laughs> in one of our, um, research as, um, excuse me, that's my timer there. So let me hurry up, <laughs> that's what that means. So this is one of the images that came up and it was called Unidentified Production 1970 or so. 
Um, but doing upon further investigation from myself and another colleague, and I don't know if this will do this, hopefully it will, we noticed there were um, two significant individuals in the photograph that people researching they might be interested in. So one person is Samuel L. Jackson, who you see, if you can see the arrow there, who went to Morehouse, but took the majority of his drama classes at Spelman. And Latanya Richardson, who her, it happens to be married to Samuel L. Jackson, but an alumni, an amazing actress um, herself. So they were not identified in the photograph, but this is where again, community engagement, my own background and knowledge and recognition, just being fans of Ms. Richardson and Mr. Jackson as well. Um, so we were able to then subsequently update and still don't know the name of the production, but really trying to find that out, uh, still be able to update the metadata as well. So with Latonda Richardson, as well as Samuel L. Jackson. So very important. And one of the other very important community aspects of the program um, or initiatives that we've done was a crowdsourcing uh, program to help identify individuals in photographs. So um, as part of the grant, we were certainly doing a lot of um, programming. And for the reunion, uh, Spelman's reunion last year, every year there's a different reunion in class. So the reunion in classes ending in fours and nines were last year. So we uh, really wanted to think about ways we could not only engage alumni, uh, particularly in this project, but also to help continue to amplify the voices of the individuals that maybe we weren't as familiar with in some of these um, images. So we, there was a general preservation workshop done uh, by myself and several colleagues from AUC Woodruff who worked on the project, as well as handouts that were created to the alumni that came. So it was uh, beforehand, you could either do a form you know, and the, there's a small Omeka instance that was created for the, um, these images for those particular years as well, as well as a physical handout for some of the alumni who came. And there's uh, my colleague, Aletha Moore Carter, who was the digitization project manager at AUC Woodruff, as well as uh, my colleague, Jessica Lemming, who also worked on the project. And we had a group, uh, and Christine Wiseman standing in that picture there, but we had a group of really engaged alumni and had a really good time. And they were able to, I believe on that picture that I just showed you for with um, Ms. Richardson and Mr. Jackson, some of the alumni were also able to identify um, a Morehouse alumni, Mr. Gordon. And he was in several of the pictures and later went on to have uh, a career in Broadway, if I'm not mistaken, but we did not have the um, information for him. So that was, well, in addition to being fun, just extremely helpful. And before um, I sign out here, I just really wanted to take this opportunity to really amplify the work um, community, not only community projects um, or digitization projects, but others that continue to amplify work by and about uh, by BIPOC communities as well. So they're continuing to do some of this great work that my colleagues have focused on um, and that I've mentioned. So I just wanted to take a moment to amplify uh, their work. And again, these slides will be available so you can do your continued research. And again, thank you all so much. And I look forward to um, further conversation. So I want to go ahead and thank all of our presenters again for their uh, sharing their uh, projects and expertise. Um, and we will be sharing all of these slides um, as well as a transcript um, uh, of the presentation with everyone. Uh, so you'll get all of those links um, and resources that they have shared. Um, Sunshine State Digital Network also has a list of additional resources that you can reference on our website um, on our documentation page uh, uh, for additional resources and conscious editing. Many of those are by our presenters today. Uh, so uh, we will go ahead and start taking any questions that you may have. Um, go ahead and uh, type those in the chat box.
So our first question is for Holly. Um, how many people worked on the projects total? Yes, thank you for that question. And um, I'm sorry if I was talking so fast. I wanted to be mindful of the time. Um, and as a true Southerner, sometimes I can um, go into a long description. <laughs> so if there, yeah, if there's anything that you, you know, wanted, I, I inadvertently missed out, um, please do feel free to ask. So that's a really good question. So there was a project manager at station at AUC. Um, my colleague, Aletha Moore Carter, that was in the presentation, as well as at the Digital Library of Georgia, where um, they were taking care of a lot of the digitization of the images as well. Now, there was an outside vendor for the digitization of the publications, but that was extraordinarily helpful. Um, and there was, a, it, we have student workers, not specifically for this project, but we had student workers at Spelman, but there was a, a student specifically hired at AUC Woodruff to help with this project, um, which is helpful because we're a small but mighty <laughs> team of two in the Spelman Archives, I like to say that. So we, um, they were able to come and our colleagues help us pack up materials. Um, it was just very well organized, I think. Um, and I should say it was a two and a half year, almost three year project. So um, just having that you know, support from our colleagues at uh, AUC DLG was really helpful, certainly on our end in terms of getting the materials um, together. Thank you. Um, next question is for Kelly. Uh, can you describe how you manage the versioning and commit notes process? Sure. Um, so our versioning system that we're using right now um, is called Subversion and it's part of the Oxygen XML package, um, editor package. Um, so it's something that we already had set up for our workflow. Um, it's how archivists kind of push changes to the finding aid site. And we've always had a practice, or I guess since, since we've had the system in 2012, we've always had a practice of making short commit notes um, to kind of document the different versions of finding aids that we have. Um, but it's also saved, the, the older versions of finding aids are saved there. And I will say that we are currently in the process of moving our data to archive space. So something that we're exploring now is how to keep that versioning system, even if we're not kind of using, using the tool that we're used to using. Um, Kayla, do you want me to keep answer the next one too? While I'm at yeah, it? go ahead. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll just read it so that um, for the recording, um, how often do you suggest a correction button get used and what types of issues tend to get flagged? Um, I would say, so the, again, the suggested correction button is something that we did have and we've sort of been repurposing to try and um, encourage people to use it for this purpose. And I will say that we haven't gotten as many suggested corrections along the lines of the inclusive description work as I would have hoped, but we are, we continue to um, inform people about it. Um, but I will say in terms of the things that have been flagged on these issues, um, one thing that we got was um, people described kind of using generic um, terms like being referred to as Native American when they could be identified based on what um, nation that they were a part of. So kind of adding like enhancing description. Um, and there was also, so one of the examples I mentioned was something that one of our public services colleagues brought up and they use this button a lot too. Um, so to let us know that the collection wasn't exactly, wasn't actually this man's papers and it was actually um, a collection created by two people. Um, so yeah, so there's a, there's a wide range. And then someone wanted to know if your lexicons, scripts and tools are available on GitHub. Um, the majority of them, I have a few test scripts that are available on my GitHub, um, but so they're not available online, but I'm happy to share them um, if people would like to get in, in contact with me. Um, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Uh, this question is for any of our presenters. Uh, did you come across any proper titles thinking of articles, photographs uh, with captions that contained offensive or outdated language? How did you handle these? And did you use a supply title or did you include an explanatory note or something else? Um, we definitely ran into uh, work choices that were not, that were now as blatant and harmful, especially with little people because there was a 
there was a weird surface hierarchy of different medical elements of dwarfism that were built differently. And we provided an accurate title, but that was a conscious choice, not only because we wanted because we wanted the title to be accurate, but there are researchers out there with disability in particular, and I found this out through um, research and looking um, at a couple of academic articles. But people might search through a medical diagnosis. They might search using outdated terminology, or they might be a surface specialist. Yes, no success that are using those very specific terms on purpose. So to not exclude researchers, we did keep the proper assigned title, but because we have the language statement out there on the site, we're able to acknowledge the problem without going in the detail in the description proper. Thanks, Meg. Um, has anyone else come across this issue? I can just add briefly that um, I haven't personally yet come across this issue for a proper title. Um, but one of the things that we've discussed in our working group is generally how we think that we're going to handle this case is if it is the proper title of the material, we're going to kind of make it very clear that that is the title that we're taking from the materials rather than an archivist supplied title. It's some it's sometimes unclear the difference between those things and finding aids. So we've talked about kind of like using quotation marks to make it clear that it's not archivist supplied description. Um, and we also have drafted like boilerplate for cases where this these decisions mean that there is going to be this language in the finding aid just to let users know that it is original and that it is there and to kind of give them a warning and a heads up. Um, I will say that I think there's always exceptions and I think there's cases where that might not be appropriate, but that's the approach that we've discussed together. Um, I'll just add that at UNC uh, for Wilson Library Special Collections Finding Aids, we have decided to remove racist slurs, even if it is from the proper title. Um, and so we have redacted um, <clears throat> racist terms and slurs from, from titles within the Finding Aids. Yeah, and I think that Dorothy mentioned in uh, the first presentation, which is available on YouTube if you didn't get a chance to watch it, um, that it's also possible to include the um, original title in the description and note that that was the uh, title on the item. Um, so I think there are, there are different approaches that you can take um, depending on how your institution uh, chooses to approach that. Uh, does UNC include the unredacted version in a note? Um, no, um, we don't. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, we have another question. I'd love to have some conversation between Laura and Holly on how Spellman's digitization project can inform Wilson's the goal of describing a central audience for Black genealogists family historians and vice versa? Well, I'm always ready to collaborate with Holly. <laughs> that is a, such a great question and, a, and, and such a great thing to, to possibly explore. Holly, what do, you, what do you think? Yeah, so I don't know, full disclosure, I had the ultimate pleasure of working with Laura and some other wonderful comrades for five years, um, it seems like a million years ago at Chapel Hill and like you said, we had some really excellent conversations just around, you know, description and particularly amplifying the voices, specifically of the Black people reflected in the material. So, Krishana, that is a wonderful, um, yeah, that's really a wonderful uh, thing to think about. So, Laura, you know, like you said, we, we have, um, and I really think one of the, the good things is, I know, our other colleagues, uh, Shay Trapal, who's African-American materials um, 
archivist, and forgive me, her title might be different now, and our other colleague, uh, Biff Hollingsworth, have done a lot of wonderful things around community archives, period. So Lori could really be, you know, creating work, you know, in this, <laughs> but this is the good work in this, um, particularly perhaps post pandemic or maybe virtual, some kind of, you know, really great kind of conversation around mining these resources or, Laura, I can't remember, I think, was there a similar um, photo identification project that was done maybe with the North Carolina um, photograph collection or a while, but yeah, Krishan, it was just a really, and I didn't mention this when I was talking, again, wanted to really be mindful of time, but uh, we have, in this COVID era, it has been very invaluable to have these materials digitized you know, not for a research period. And we have gotten quite a number of genealogical requests um, that people, you know, continue to, you know, be able to do this work in the accessibility. Um, so maybe even, you know, and then there's the um, Afro-American Genealogical Society. Atlanta has a very strong chapter and one of our colleagues, Tamika Strong in the state who's an archivist is um, just, just wonderful workshops around uh, genealogy. So um, Laura, you know, we, we've got some, some things to talk about. That's a great, it's a great and, idea. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, let's start talking right away. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, this is the good work. <laughs> I, I think, you know, that, you know, there's this critical question of audience and I raised the question of, can we make um, black genealogists and family historians, a primary audience for our description of plantation records. And one of the, you know, the key things to do is to connect with the audience that we're trying to reach. And I think a collaborative um, community archives and coll interinstitutional collaboration is um, a brilliant idea. Thank you, Krishana. And then also on that, um, just want to also say what I've been really encouraged by, not just this project, but really just being at Spelman and engaging with these wonderful young students who are very um, active and organizing around, you know, activism and social justice work, just the critical role of articulating, you know, your voice as a place of empowerment, um, particularly thinking about what does that mean to Black students at, a, at HBCU and how the archives, it's just been a, a delight to see, you know, not thinking about the archives as just stuffy old places and passive keepers of dead records, you know, the, the students and, you know, and, and it's like they would have seen themselves, I think, before, but just the connection and connectivity, you know, just the general excitement that they've been able to see, you know, seeing your books as as a way of like, oh, that's cool, we do that now, but also to helping to inform their own work has just continued to be a treat. Um, you know, not just thinking about them getting in this field, because I'm always interested in getting, you know, these wonderful students at Spelman and AUC into the field, but they can see the, the connection and connectivity with their own work, like linking back from the Atlanta student movement during the civil rights movement or students locking in the board of trustees in the 70s because they didn't appoint a woman president. That's a real thing. Um, yeah, so we can go on about that. But <laughs> I think, you know, and again, to, to Laura and Krishana's um, and, and Kimberly's point too, just connecting with the students. And, uh, and if you're not familiar with Project Stan, please go to their website because they really have a lot of wonderful resources and do great work around amplifying the voices of student activism in archives. So thank you. Um, I think that's an important reminder about why why this work is important, right? So that people can find themselves in the archives that we um, have taken so much time to care for and provide access to. Um, we want to make sure that people find themselves and what they're looking for. Um, and I think it's also uh, a great, uh, all of you provided great examples of how to uh, work together. I think it's an important uh, thing to note that this is not work that should be done in a silo. Um, there's a lot of resources out there and there are a lot of people who are interested in working together on projects like this. Um, so use your communities, use your colleagues, and I think um, this work is attainable uh, for all of us. Uh, do we have any additional questions? We have a few minutes left.
Um, I just want to point out that my wonderful colleague, Nancy uh, Kaiser, um, shared a link to a finding aid at UNC where we have redacted the slur and included a processing note. Um, so that that's a good example of um, what what we have done um, with the decision that we did not want that language in our in our finding aids. Thank you, Laura. Um, we'll also provide a chat transcript um, with the video um, for everyone. Um, so I will also uh, acknowledge Kelly's uh, statement earlier that this is a very stressful week for many of us. If you have not had the opportunity to vote, please do so tomorrow. Uh, it's very important this year. Uh, and. You know, I just hope everyone has a, as stress-free a week as possible. Um, thank you so much for attending. Um, and the recording will be available on YouTube tomorrow.